Good morning. Good morning, Mary. Uh, this is Tuesday, March the 1st, 2022, and this is the interview of Christine Mor Norris, and it is part of the Legal History Project. And I'm Mary Burrs, and I have the uh, honor and the pleasure of talking with Chris. Christine, I'm Chris. Uh -huh. That's right, this <laughs> morning. Um, good morning, Chris. Good morning, Mary. I want to ask you about your background, starting when you were just a little girl, <sighs> because there's so much there's so much that led to what you ultimately did. Well, I had a lot of opportunities along the way, and I and I made some of my own. Sure. But um, but yeah, because I I'm the first person in my family to go to college. Wow. Well, and my mother was in a was born in Scotland in in Air, Scotland, and so she was real smart. But um, you know, they had she came to the U.S., emigrated to Canada, and then the U.S. She was the youngest in a, a, a family with seven children. Like her father had been a shoe cobbler. <laughs> in Scotland. In Scotland, yes. And so, um, so they didn't have any opportunities during the Depression. And my father was orphaned at a very early age. And his parents died of TB. And so they valued education. And they, they had some frustration because when they worked in the... Um, they both worked for Shell Oil Company, and that people with people were uh, tr they trained people who were then promoted over them because those people had been to college. So they really early on they had us put money. Our, they gave us an allowance. We put part of it in a bank account for it was our college money, college fund. So so they instilled that in you right from the get go. Yes, it, the it value of my education. And I. Yes, yeah. I had one brother. The value of education, the value of money. Mm -hmm. and, and what money can do in terms of preparing you for your future. It also gave me some empathy when I um, hear about first generation college students, because it's, there's an issue there that comes up uh, once you go to college and you come home and you want to talk about it with your parents. And sometimes my, my parents got kind of defensive about it, you know, because I was studying some. I took some psychology courses, although I didn't major in that. And my mother said, I always thought you were psychoanalyzing me. There's sort of a, don't, you know, it, it, there's a separation that results from being, having those opportunities when your parents didn't. Yes, yes. But, but uh, isn't that interesting? They didn't realize the, the value of their own, uh, their own intelligence, <laughs> their own ability to perceive. Oh, it. no, they valued that. But they just didn't want me to think that I was somehow they, they imagined that people who went to college thought they were better. Than oh, them. it was a chip on the shoulder. Yes, yes. So, yes, there's a loss that getting being more educated than your parents with some parents. It may not be true for everybody, but they certainly if, if they thought that they were definitely wrong. Yeah. Well, yeah although I, there were probably times when I was a little too full of myself. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I, think, I think that's true. That's, that's true, true of everybody. Where, where did you grow up? I grew up in Michigan. Um, I was born in the Detroit area. And my, when my, my parents got married, they both worked for Shell. So my, back then, my, my mother had to quit the women. They couldn't have couples that were married working at yes. the same company. So she had to quit. And when, after she died, and she was 83, I found she had saved her last pay stub. It was so important to her because I looked at the census figures and she was, she was the youngest in her family, but of the three youngest who were still living at home when they were working, she was making more than anybody. She did well. Um, she was uh, successful in her career at that point. So she was a loss for her to quit, but she quit because she wanted to get married to my dad. And, uh, but what, what were we talking about? Well, we, we were talking about where you grew up. Oh yeah, Michigan. <laughs> and then my father worked for Shell. So we moved to Saginaw. He got transferred to Saginaw and then we got, he got transferred to Grand Rapids. So I went to high school in East Grand Rapids. My parents when they moved, they always, my father asked people where, what area has the best public schools. And East Grand Rapids, Michigan, um, I didn't know it at the time, but looking back now and realizing later, it has fabulous schools and it's wonderful. It's like a small town, it's a suburb, but it's part of the city of Grand Rapids, but it's separate, sort of like, um, I don't know what you would say, East Nashville, if, if, if East Nashville had a separate government. <laughs> uh, 
So anyway, so I went there and everybody was going to college at that high school. Whereas in Saginaw, where I had transferred from, I went to my freshman year at Saginaw. Um, they want, one of my, my best friend married a bean farmer and um, that this Saginaw is the bean capital of the world, a lot of farming and agriculture. So people went into the military, a few went to community college, but there wasn't a lot of uh, push or expectation to, to go to uh, college, especially out of state colleges. And, and that changed with, with your family's moving to Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids, yes. isn't it interesting? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, now that you are a parent, I'm a parent, to, to, uh, to realize the uh, extent that our own parents. Well, in our peer group. Right, right. The, the, the extent that our, our parents uh, changed their lives in order to make our lives better. Mm -hmm. it, it really uh, it astounds me sometimes that I was not aware of it at mm -hmm. the time, but I certainly am now as a parent to realize there are some sacrifices that are involved in that. Right. Um, what did you do? Did you, did, did you like reading as a child? Oh, I love to read. My brother, he sort of to, to still to this day resent, resents and talks about it. Whenever we got in trouble, we'd have, my parents would send us to our rooms and he hated being sent to his room. Well, I loved it. I would just have, I had a lot of books. I would just read, made me happy. I could go to another world. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking I might send myself to my room sometimes. Yeah, send myself. <laughs> and when my parents, when they would get together with my mother's brother in Detroit, we'd visit family and my, and my father's sister. They would always play cards. They'd play canasta or euchre. And I would just read. I would find books and read. I remember my uncle John and Aunt Marge in Royal Oak, Michigan. I would go to their basement and they had a set of uh, books down there. Like people collect these sort of gold bound books. One oh, of sure. them was the, uh, the Three Musketeers. Oh, I yes. I read the Three Musketeers in their basement. On uh, one New Year's, I think, when we were all uh, staying up till two, <laughs> I could hear them shouting about the card game upstairs. <laughs> and you were in your own world. Own world. <laughs> where, where did you go to college? Well, um, a lot of, as I said, everybody in my high school was going to college. So, and some people were going to places like uh, Wellesley, you know. So I, I looked everywhere, and I, but I was clear my parents couldn't afford a private school like that, but. Um, we visited all the schools in Michigan, like uh, Michigan State, University of Michigan, um, Western Michigan, and there was another one, I can't remember the name of it, a church college. Well, the church college seemed too small, and the University of Michigan seemed too big, and I was there on a rainy day, you know, and it was gloomy, and the dorms looked depressing. Yeah. <laughs> so I had heard of a college in Ohio, Miami of Ohio. And Miami University. So um, I had never visited, but I went, so I applied there and got in. And my, the college counselor at my high school said it was a good school. Um, and then uh, friends told me, oh, that's a party school. Well, I didn't really know what a party school was. I just knew that I like parties. <laughs> <laughs> so I went. Sounded like a good choice. Yeah, I don't know. I went. It, it turned out not to be a good fit for me, but I made yes. good friends there. Now, how long did you stay at Miami? Two years. Two years. Two years. Okay. See, I left there. I went there in 66. I left in 68. Um, several things happened that spurred that on. I, and when school ended, I really didn't have plans to transfer. But I was very frustrated because um, Martin Luther King had been shot in the spring of 68. That's right. And there was like no reaction from students at the school. And it was a there weren't really black students at the school. There was a big town gown um, separation and there were a lot of black people in the town, but they had very little to do with the college. And it just felt um, like I did not really part of the world. I wrote, I wrote a letter to the uh, school paper editor, the editor of the school paper saying, this is places like Brigadoon, yes. that the mists fall. and. <laughs> And we don't know what's happening in the in Vietnam in Martin, with Martin Luther King and um, later on, of course, Bobby Kennedy. But it was a very frustrating place to be. And but I had no plans to leave. But then a good friend and I uh, took the school up. On, they had offered a charter flight to Europe to London for that that spring for three hundred dollars. 
$300. $300. And well, that was, um, I think even the flight was 178 and <laughs> each. And then we figured with the rest of the 300, we could, you know, stay. Back then, there was a book called Europe on $5 a day. Yes, I remember that. Yeah, book. so we figured <laughs> if we spent $5 a day, we could survive on $300 for the whole trip. Wow, that for was six you, weeks. That's right. They give you six weeks. Six weeks in Europe. Anyway, so we did that. And uh, that opened my eyes to the rest of the world in a way that nothing oh, else where did. You go? Well, we started in London and we, um, you know, we found we would find places to stay, like rooming houses that had other young people and hostels. Yes. Or if the hostel was full, they would send you to cheap housing that had other students. So uh, there were students there from New Zealand and Australia and all over the world. And then we went to Paris. We took a train, I think it was, to Paris and stayed in a $5 hotel in Paris. You know, we would share a double bed and um, and there were oh, there weren't elevators. You had to walk up um, and eat bread and bread and cheese, you know, on the street. And uh, then we went down to Germany, Italy, Germany, and in Munich. We were in Munich at a, a one of those um, it's a beer beer garden. Yeah. And we started talking to these two guys. One was from Australia, and one was New Zealand. And then we got we were sitting and we became friends with them. And, and by that point, we realized that we couldn't afford, we, our $300 was going to run out. It was going to be six weeks. No, and for a that we could do it on meals, but the transportation costs, the train costs were going to do us in. So um, they, we had started hitchhiking. And these guys said, what are, if you hitchhike with us, you know, we'll be safer. Because yeah, I had had a bad experience already hitchhiking in, I think it was Italy, but Nothing bad happened, but I felt threatened. So, um, so uh, we started hitchhiking with them, and we were in a garden one time in Germany, and we got approached by men from Iran, and they wanted these guys to drive BMWs. We go I, later on it dawned, but these guys are smugglers. They're smugglers. Oh my but at that point, I was so naive and innocent. I just said, okay. Why don't we do it? The guys could drive. We'd go along for the ride. So we were going to drive, take these cars and Nivea cream. They were taking in Nivea cream and BMWs to Tehran. So uh, we got as far as um, Istanbul. We drove through Bulgaria and I saw like ox carts, you know, men hauling ox, their crops on ox carts. This it was an adventure. It was just so eye opening. And, but then we, we had to get a visa to go to Tehran. So we went to the embassy, the American embassy in um, Istanbul. And the guy said to us, all, all four of us, I know what you're doing and you're gonna end up in a dungeon somewhere and we're not gonna be able to help you. Well, that nobody else paid much attention to him. He gave us the visa, visas, but I decided I, I didn't, because my girlfriend had, had partnered with one of the guys and I really hadn't. So I decided I'm gonna go back because we had to catch our flight out of London. So um, I took the Orient Express by myself back from Istanbul to London. And that was fun. That was interesting. There were women, like Middle Eastern women with little Bunsen burners on the floor, like cooking food on the train. Um, so I made the, I, I, I sold my friend's return ticket, left the money for her at American Express and got home, flew home on the scheduled flight. <laughs> So that was an adventure. And then when I got home, I thought I cannot go back to Oxford, Ohio. So <laughs> I applied to Michigan, got in. University of Michigan. University of Michigan. Got, drove, drove over there and they let me in. I, I had one F or D in social dancing because it was on the other side of the camp, campus and it was winter at eight o'clock in the morning. You and had I had a D in social, social dancing. dancing. You know, I love to dance. I just didn't show up a lot of the time. So and it was a, a written test. <laughs> but I transferred to Michigan and I uh, met up with a couple of my friends from Miami who had also transferred uh, to Michigan. And we lived in a co-op together at uh, University of Michigan. All women, it's like 30 women in this COVID, we had to make our own food. We had to make menus and um, it was a lot less expensive and for my parents than um, paying what they had to pay for Miami. 
what an adventure you made out of college. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, it was an exciting time. Everybody was, the world was opening to young people. <laughs> and you took advantage of it. I took advantage of it. You took advantage, advantage of it. Yeah, of I did. <laughs> so it, it's almost like a, like, a, like a, a letdown. Did you do anything after college? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, but I need to say that that summer when I got back home after the trip to Europe, I got a job with uh, the Grand Rapids schools uh, being a teaching assistant in 19, it was the summer of 1968. And so there had been riots in Detroit and other places, LA and my parents, they had no qualms about letting me go into downtown, you know, uh, urban area. Grand Rapids, and, but the, my neighbors, they couldn't believe that my parents were letting me go. You know, that's, everybody was frightened. People were frightened. But I went and I had a good experience uh, being a teaching assistant. It was then a summer program for black students. How old were the, were the uh, They were like kids. in second or third grade. Mm -hmm. And the one summer that was, yeah. first of all. <laughs> rich, it was a very rich summer. It was, it was. Um, and 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 then and then you became a, a, a teaching aide uh, in, a, in an urban school in, in Grand Rapids. Rapids, right? During during the the, 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 the riots. Uh -huh. okay. Well, it really Grand Rapids was so out of it when it came to people being aware of. There was no anger. At least I did not perceive anger in the black community. There should have been a lot of anger, but there wasn't. And there, I never felt threatened or unsafe. There was more the white people being afraid. <laughs> what about at, at the university? What, what, did you have a major or something? Yes, I went back and I majored. I st still love to read, uh, so I didn't know what I was going to do, but I thought my, my mother said being a teacher would be good because you could have your summers off, you know, and spend time with your children. So I uh, got a teaching certificate and uh, majored in English, and then I student taught in England in my senior year for a semester in Sheffield, England. And that was a also wonderful experience. That was, a, a, at the time, I recall that, that, that England was really at the forefront of, of, of elementary education. Well, I had to take a course in the English education system before I went. So, uh, I didn't see it as the forefront. I saw it as, well, they were having a lot more classroom control than we had had here. Uh, the students, all everybody had to wear uniforms. When you walk into the room, the students all stood and said, good morning, miss, whatever your name was. Right. And uh, at the afternoons, people would bring a tea cart around after lunch um, for the teacher to have a cup of tea in the, in the class from the tea cart. And, but there, the school I went to, it was a comprehensive school. So it meant that two thirds of the kids in England left school at age 15, because they took the, um, I think it's the O level, and a lot of them just left and didn't take it. And they would go into the trades or whatever jobs they could find, which is what the predominant people did. It was only if you went to a school, if, if your school, either a private school, or they called them public schools or um, a school in a good neighborhood that would uh, prepare you to take those tests, the O level and the A level, to go to university, to finish, to go to school till you're 18 and go to university. So in that way, it was kind of backwards. Opportunities were, it wasn't, of course, it wasn't a level playing field here either, but my perception was, is that there was less opportunity for kids. But, but think of, of what you had experienced by the time you finished college. Mm. And, and you, you had become a world traveler, really. Really, the world was a lot, it seemed a lot smaller to me then, because <laughs> I because it was so easy to travel. It's easy, it was easier to travel then when you could fly to Europe for $178 round trip. <laughs> and, and hop a train, you, you did some things <laughs> that today, I'm not sure that even young people would be would be that um, willing to well, do Well, you know, I was naive, but I enjoyed it. And here you are here today. I, am. I live to tell the tale. <laughs> so what did you do after college? What, what, what well, I went to the uh, intercut interviews for teaching jobs. Yes. But I looked like I was about 12. And so <laughs> nobody would hire me. And plus, there was a teacher glut at that point. Things, these things seemed to ebb and flow. So not many people were hiring. And I, as I was there interviewing for teaching jobs and feeling kind of discouraged, 
um, there was a table set up for, by people looking for VISTA volunteers. And VISTA is, means Volunteers in Service to America, which is like, Ameri it's been renamed AmeriCorps. AmeriCorps. And so um, I applied. I applied with, while I was leaving one of these discouraging teaching interviews. I sent, filled out the application and then I promptly forgot about it. And then when spring neared, and I was gonna uh, finish school in spring in, in April, so then I got a telegram. I'd, have, I'd never gotten a telegram that said <laughs> I was accepted and they were gonna assign me, accepted to Vista and they were assigning me to Denver and they would send me a plane ticket. And I, that was the answer to my prayers. I didn't have to go back to Grand Rapids. So I went to Denver and um, it was a wonderful formative experience because there were a lot of guys in VISTA trying to get deferments because this was before the Vietnam lottery, before the, the, the draft was replaced by the lottery. So they were trying to get draft deferments. So it was a good group and all young people wanting to change the world. So we, we but none of us with any skills, <laughs> we weren't nurses, we weren't. You know, we hadn't, didn't have any particular, we could read. <laughs> so some of the people there got sent to, a, after the training, got sent to an Indian reservation, a Native American reservation outside Salt Lake City. And I got assigned to Salt Lake City and um, had my, got, found my first serious boyfriend in Vista. So that was, I mean, I dated before that, but nobody, I was excited about. <laughs> so I've had a great year. And I uh, did you teach? No, well, we started. Uh, well, there were already some night schools that the prior vistas had the year before had started. So uh, I, I taught English as a second language um, to foreign students, I mean, or wives of students at the University of uh, Utah. And I taught um, GE, GED preparation, people trying to take the GED. But it was so hard in adult education. My hat's off to people who do that because they've, they've worked all day and they come to this, they're exhausted, they've got kids at home and they were, they wanted to learn, you know, it was so different from my student. Thing. Well, I had to also student teach in Michigan when I got back mm -hmm. from England and students there were kind of rowdy, even the students in Ann Arbor. So, um, it was the adult students were just very um, determined. And I also started a brownie troop in, in the community center, Salt Lake City Community Center. And it was such an experience living in Salt Lake because I was a minority. I'd never been, other than being in Europe, when I was, you know, an American foreigner, I was a foreigner. I think of the Church of Latter-day Saints as, yes. as predominantly uh, a, a population. Yeah, That's the Church of Latter Day Saints, are colloquially, colloquially known as Mormons, and even yes. back then they called themselves Mormons. Mm -hmm. um, they were they were just everywhere. They were, they ran the banks. They ran they owned the banks. They owned the newspaper, the Salt Lake City Press. And if I wanted a job, you know, I was surround, I was hired by Mormons, and they were typically wanted to hire other Mormons. And the, the press never even covered the Vietnam War until we finally, when I was in Vista, we um, we did a, had a rally, a protest, you know, that they finally covered that. Uh, Were you one of the protesters? I was one of the protest anti-war <laughs> protesters, but uh, I wasn't willing to get arrested, which now I think would have thought, well, who cares? But back then, I didn't know the consequences of being arrested. Sure. But I went, I, I, I was there at the protest with the sign and, um, and there were all these things that people, non-Mormon, like non-Mormons would tell each other we would, to try to uh, navigate this environment about, uh, and the Mormons were by and large good people, but they just had these odd, to me, I'm sure the beliefs are sacred to them. And I don't mean to disparage that faith at all, but um, they wore this special underwear that they, when you get married or after you come back from your, um, your missionary your mission work. work, yeah. Then you got this underwear that protects you. It is sacred, and you're never supposed to take it off. And they would, and they'd have a robe they carried around the streets with a little suitcase. So it was a, a interesting experience. And again, please forgive me if anybody watching this is Mormon. I don't mean to disparage your faith, but as an outsider, I didn't get the whole story. I just get little bits of it. 
And you were in your what early 20s at the time? Yeah, uh, 22. My. And, and how long did you stay in Salt Lake City? Well, I finished the Vista year and then uh, we saved money. Um, the guy I was with then, and we went to Europe after that year and came back and um, we rented a house together and a friend of mine from college came out to live with us. And I got a job with the school system, the Salt Lake City school system, to training fifth and sixth graders to tutor first and second graders in reading. And it was a good job. I liked it. I had fun. Although that also, there was one Mormon teacher at the school and the rest of them were all either Presbyterian or Catholic. And they persecuted that poor woman. They would like bring in a cake, it was a mint julep cake, and didn't tell her that it had alcohol in it until after she'd had a piece, you know, and then they said, oh, that had alcohol. You think adults could be cruel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. What an experience that was. Um, one more way to see the world. What, what, what did you do after Salt Lake City? Well, um, I had developed a really good uh, relationship with the principal at that school. And I'm, I don't know why, he just took a liking to me. It was one of those things that happens, I think, when you've got a youthful glow and you um, have some initiative. He just sort of took me under his wing and would be telling me the story of his life and things like that. Uh, but I broke up with the boyfriend. And so he's, anyway, I don't have to give you the down and dirty, but um, I, I decided I had to leave. So uh, uh, I, I had saved enough money for a plane ticket back to Grand Rapids. And because I, I was heartbroken at that point. And I called the principal and said, I'm sorry, I'm going to have something in my personal life. I've got to leave. But then when I got Back, that really relationship served me well because a, a year or so later, when I decided to apply to Peabody for a, a master's degree, it was in early education, early child. So I listed him as a reference, and he must have given me a really good reference because you got into I got into that <laughs> master's program where they um, paid for my schooling. I got they paid me to come there, so. That was a good thing. But between that, I went to Grand Rapids and then I got a job teaching math at a job course center in Kentucky. So I did, I traveled with the boxing team. <laughs> you traveled with the boxing team to Chattanooga. <laughs> I'd never been to Tennessee before, uh, except for a friend's wedding. But And there you were in Tennessee and heading towards Nashville. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was eventually, because I, I got into that master's program at Peabody, which then had not merged with Vanderbilt. It was a standalone school. And it was funded by NIMH at National Institute of Mental Health. So they paid, they paid the tuition and they gave me a living stipend. It was like $300 a month. Um, and, you know, I had to get another job. It wasn't enough to completely live on, but certainly it was a, something to be grateful for because I couldn't have been there. I couldn't have gotten that education, but for that. And that took a year and a half to get a master's degree in, it was in psychology, but it was early childhood education. You, you have led a very adventuresome <laughs> life, even in your mid-20s. Well, you know? my father always told me to see the world, see the world. And you took him up on that. Yeah, I, I, and he also told me to paddle my own canoe. <laughs> so I paddled that and canoe. And so you did. So <laughs> here you are in Nashville, but I bet that's not going to be for long. Did well, you I finished the program and okay. then I had to um, find a job. And I got a job. Um, there was a, a program run by the Appalachian Regional Commission in East Tennessee, in rural East, Upper East Tennessee. So it was based in Knoxville. So I got that job um, to be to train and supervise women who were home educators, would go up into the hills, um, down hollers, yes. <laughs> and take books and toys and, uh, you know, and talk to parents about how to you know, work with their children in a way that would uh, be educational for the children. This was what, in the early 70s? About that time? Um, let's see. I finished, though, I finished, uh, um, it was 73 when I finished the grad program, the master's okay. program. So mm -hmm. I went to Knoxville. A friend of mine helped me move. I had a little black and white television. And uh, that's about my only possession other than clothing, you know, you know maybe a chair <laughs> and a bedspread. But I found this apartment. And the first morning, my friend went back to Nashville and I turned on the 
black and white television and, and all I could get, you know, there was no cable, it was all local. And they were all uh, like evangelists on every station <laughs> in Knoxville. I thought, Lord, where am I? <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> but, we, but it was a good experience. We had, we, there were three of us. There was a, a social work, someone, a social worker, a nurse, and me, I, home education. And we would travel up to um, Johnson City, Rogersville. What's the city where, um, where um, Howard Baker is from? Oh, not, not Greenfield? No, but uh, I forget. But Kingsport? No, I, but anyway, sure all these little uh -huh. cities, they were big cities in their uh -huh. areas. But Bristol? Would, Bristol? No, but I can't remember. Elizabeth. No, but, but it'll uh, come to me. Okay. Um, anyway, so, so we were on the road a lot, um, and, but I enjoyed it. It was good, except that I, after a year, I was sort of, I was frustrated with that job because, you know, we did, we were doing our best to do what was expected of us, but there was no really good evaluation tool to tell if we were making a difference. Um, and I think that was in order to continue the funding, you couldn't just say this is this is how we're doing, we're performing these activities. <laughs> you needed to show that it would make a difference in what we were doing. So um, I wrote an article for the uh, Early Childhood Education magazine, and I had a friend who was a photographer who uh, came with me, and he took pictures of like chickens and you know, little houses, little log cabins that have coal fuel stoves, coal yes. wood stove, heated by wood stoves, and little children running. I mean, I remember we got. So um, it was very discouraging because we had a child who these nurses were going to see and they loved this child. And then he died and they, when they couldn't figure out why he died and they realized he had worms, he was running around barefooted and he'd gotten worms. And he'll, I mean, oh, how could we, that could have been prevented if, so, you know, there were things that were frustrating. Sure, and you were encountering for the first time with, with poverty in Upper East Tennessee who we met. Right. And and uh, and lack of health care. Yes. What, what, it, mm -hmm. what it really meant. And there was no early- uh, You were you know, a witness to that. To that, and there were no organized preschools. I mean, there were, so yes. we were doing the home visits. It was like all that people had access to if we were continue, if we got more funding. And I also ran up against uh, personalities and language in up in rural Tennessee, like they would say, the uh, the copy machines all tore up. <laughs> I thought, what in the world? All tore up. I don't. And I apparently, they one of them told me later that my manner struck them as very brusque. Um, they thought that I didn't like them because I was so brusque. But I think it was just my Yankee. Mm -hmm. I was a Yankee, and but it isn't that they had a dislike for Yankees, but I was just more direct. It was an education for them to, yeah. to see another another kind of way I'm of interacting. Interacting, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. What an experience that was! It's yeah. like an education. That itself. was a big education. Yes. So, so Granger we, County. We went to Granger County, and we went to because they school got out for people to harvest the tobacco. Oh my! In the sure, fall, they would cut cut tobacco. Cut tobacco in the fall, and. Um, the kids there's great well, people, yeah. The, the, kids. the kids, yeah. School, they have to not go to school. They the schools would close for them to cut the tobacco, cut the tobacco. put it in the tobacco bar. That was their big crop, wasn't mm -hmm. it? Wow. Cash crop. At some point, at some point in this incredible life, mm -hmm. you became a lawyer. Yeah. Now, well, how did how did that transition? <laughs> well, um, I, besides being frustrated about the uh, difficulty in showing the impact of what we were doing, I was also sort of tired of working with all women. And although I like women, but um, I just wanted a more co-educational, more diverse environment. And my father, who had, he had wanted to be a lawyer, but he'd never had the opportunity. He said he thought of being a lawyer would be interesting. When he worked for Shell Oil, he, he would go out to new um, gas stations that were, they were all then owned individually and they were called jobbers for the, um, for the oil companies. And so he would help them open the station and develop their relationship with the company. But he would also work with lawyers who would find the land for the, the real estate for the gas stations. And so he watched what they did in the real estate law. And he said he thought it would be interesting. So um, 
And I actually took the uh, LSAT back when I was at Michigan, but then I didn't apply anywhere. I, and until I, I was in Utah, when I was in Utah, I applied to law school, University of, uh, University of Utah, but they didn't admit me. And I was surprised because I thought I had good credentials. So I went and talked to the admission person and he was kind of embarrassed. And he said, well, you know, you've been out of college for a couple of years or a year. And they wanted, I think they just wanted men from straight out of college. So rather than have this strange woman from Michigan who'd been out of college for a couple of years, they were willing to take a chance on me. But it turned out for the best. I'm glad I didn't get in there because then I was working in Tennessee in Knoxville and I had saved money. I was single still. And um, I applied to the University of Tennessee and I didn't even apply anywhere else. Back then, the tuition was $175 a quarter. Oh my. Yes. And I had saved enough um, that I could support myself. I knew I'd have to get a job to live, a uh, part time job. But then I, I, also, I also applied to the Peace Corps and to a USAID program. And I was accepted by all of them, the law school and the uh, Peace Corps was going to send me to Jamaica. And oh. uh, USAID was going to send me to West Africa. Oh, wow. And I'd have an inside uh, bedroom and an outside bedroom. I looked into all this. But I knew by then I was, um, it was 1976. So I think I was about 26 or 27. And I knew I wanted to get married and have kids. And I thought that I looked at these three opportunities and the law school seemed like the more likely uh, place to meet people. And then I got a letter that they'd given me a scholarship for the oh, wow. tuition for the first year. That's and I the thought deal, huh? it was a sign. <laughs> <laughs> but this is about the same time, I guess, Jimmy Carter would have been president about, That's right. about that time, just mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as a time marker. Right. Wow. So, so that's, that's the, that's where you made that fork in the road or several forks. Actually, you took one, one, one road. Right. And I didn't have to move because I, I was already, already in there. there. <laughs> yeah. And I had no idea what lawyers did really. You know, I had never met a lawyer um, other than Perry Mason or people on TV, but I figured that it was probably, it was probably, there were probably a number of ways to use the, the credentials. So I thought it, it's just another fork in the road and let me try it, you know, so I thought I would try it. And it That's was remarkable. You had no idea where it was going to go, no. but, but you decided that you were going to, right. that you were going to try it. Yeah. And my father had said it would be interesting. So I thought, you know, and then I remember when I told someone I got in, this friend of mine, he said, well, welcome to the power structure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that meant, but you know, well. Well, was it interesting? Well, the first semester was very interesting because the, I really connected with the professors the first semester. And um, whereas I'd been sort of, um, I was always sort of an argumentative person. And so, but it, it wasn't appropriate in a lot of environments, but it seemed to be appropriate in law school. <laughs> found your niche on my niche with those professors who uh, Forrest Lacey was the contracts professor and I uh, I really like him and he used this all the teachers used the Socratic method which befuddled me I thought what what is it I'm supposed to memorize <laughs> that seemed to be a common a common um, uh, way that people thought about becoming a lawyer, that it was something to memorize. Right. I remember just she tell myself. me the law, you know. Right. But, <laughs> exactly. Tell me the facts and all. The law. And, um, and I think it was a big advantage for people who had lawyers in their family. Um, a good friend of mine now, her, her father was a lawyer. And I think when well, you could talk to them about why is it they're telling me to, if they could explain all your things, you're supposed to figure out the rule of, from the case and then how to apply the rule. Right. So then you can apply the rule to other fact situations, right. but I didn't understand it. And right. I was like in the dark, I was in the dark. And procedure, why Why are the rules of procedure, civil procedure? Yes. Or criminal procedure is so yeah. important. Mm -hmm. that it's, that's a big transition, isn't it? For somebody right. who's not familiar with that whole world. Right, and I didn't have anybody to ask. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> so you- But I did okay, I did well enough. You know, I got B's or whatever back then, uh -huh. so. 
It was no. good without studying because I still I'd never gotten in the habit of studying. So I would always try to cram, you know, before exams that I could get through. But uh, I would well, come to class and then, but not read the material. <laughs> it, when when you went to law school, one of, one of the reasons why you were leaving the the the, uh, er, the field of education was that it was predominantly women. Well, and, that was one reason. Yes, of, of course. Yeah. There are, there are a number of reasons. When you got to law school, was it just the opposite? It, well, no. I was fortunate. Uh, when Barbara Moss went to law school, there were or Carol McCoy, there were very few people a few women in law school. When I got to law school in 1976, a third of my class was women. So we had a whole, we had a critical mass and we would, we could bond. And, and the guys at the law school were friendly. You yeah. know, it wasn't a problem. I don't recall right. being mistreated. Yes. Um, which, or feeling like I didn't fit in. So, so having other women in the law school class was was a familiar experience for the for the law professors, for example. By then, by yeah. then, by and then. they even had some women law professors. So it it, it had opened up. I imagine that there yeah, had the, been a time the, the, it was the, not the door way. had opened. It opened a lot more in law school than it had in the working world. Sure. Um, so I was sort of had to be. I was. There were more obstacles in entering the field than there were in succeeding in law school. But what about law review? Did you? Well, I met John Norris in law school. Now, who is John Norris? John Norris is a, he's a, I tell people I, I, I was, I married well. <laughs> he was a year ahead of me in law school and he was, he's just a great guy. And I used to, he would, he would wear this, I'm getting probably too personal here, but he was where he would wear this green puffy jacket that he still has. Uh, and I, it just used to, I'd have to like catch my throat. I'd have to, yeah, I would have to, my heart would go like this when I saw that green puffy jacket. Oh. <laughs> and he was great. And so we um, he we were in a relationship and he would got on to law would all review for his grades. Well, I didn't get on for my grades, but there was a way to write on. And so I wrote a note and it ended up being published. And so I got on through writing. And so that was a whole other experience. Being in your school. third, in your second year, or in your third? Second, year? I think it was second, second or after year. first year, maybe. Sure. Uh -huh. Yeah. And and you went on to become a notes and comment editor. I was the articles editor. Okay. Of the law review. So that that added to this whole experience, right? A brand new world, right? And the uh, um, the law review community. It became, we all bonded. We had a little community community within the law school that was very fulfilling and fun and made just supportive. Uh, Juliet Griffin was the law review editor when I was there and Mark Olive, I don't, I don't know where he is these days, and he was there. And then of course my guy, John was there and there were a lot of other people that, who were, came to practice law in Nashville. And yes. we were all on uh, um, Craig, the guy who was, he was a, a federal magistrate. I forget his last name, I'm going blank. But anyway, so we built relationships that still exist today with people that I was on law review with, even if I can't remember people's names. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that interesting that uh -huh. that experience that you had so many years ago mm -hmm. still is continuing on today with right. the people that you know. They they remember you then and uh -huh. they know you now. Right. And you for them as, as well. Mm -hmm. what, what, what a great law school experience that was. And for people who see this, video these days, I need to remind them that there was no internet, there was no uh, email, there were no uh, fax machines, we didn't have fax machines, we didn't have cell phones, and so when, when John and I wanted to communicate in the law school, and by that, back then it was just this one building on the UT campus, there was a bulletin board and we could leave notes for each other, <laughs> that was how, how uh, and we learned to do research with the books, Sure. Right. The, uh, the shepherdize. digest, shepherdizing and digest. There was no such thing as no Westlaw. No Westlaw. No Lexus. <laughs> and we had to learn that later out after when we're practicing. That was it a, would have been easier to learn it in law school. <laughs> oh, but but you but you learned how to research research the old fashioned the old way. fashioned way. You spent time hours. consuming way. <laughs> yes, and hours in the library. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I got a job. Um, um, uh, with a, before I started, before John and I 
got together. I got a job, part-time job at the law firm in Knoxville. So I was doing research for them and writing memos for them because I was I went straight through law school in two and a half years. Wow, not the traditional three years, but two and no, a half. Years. That was an advantage of going to UT because you could start in the summer and go, you still have like a month off between uh, trimesters, but you could get out in two and a half years. So I did that. And so you you almost caught up with 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 your husband. No, he did of, also did the two. And oh, half did he years. really? Yeah. Okay, so there was a year there. Year. Where he had, mm -hmm. He's yeah. a year younger than I am, but okay. I'm a, he was a year ahead of me ahead in of school. You. Yeah, because I had did all those other things. I was 27, I think, when I went uh -huh. to law school. And and you ended up in Nashville. How did that happen? Well, John was from Nashville. He, he grew up here. His parents were here. They had they were Vanderbilt professors. Our, his mother was a doctor at Vanderbilt Student Health. So um, he, after, when I was finishing that last year, he worked for a while in Knoxville. He was got a job uh, doing title searches, but then it, he, uh, there was more, more job opportunities in Nashville. So he, and we were friends with Juliet and Walter Kurtz. And so Walter Kurtz was by then the public defender here. And so John applied at the public defender's office. And, and he also applied at some law firms, but he ended up going to the public defender's office. Um, and I, I stayed behind for like six months and took the bar exam. And so we went back and forth. We could like uh, drive back and forth between Knoxville and Nashville in a trance. <laughs> Just get it done. I forty existed. I forty, yeah, <laughs> existed in highways. <laughs> and so, and so, you spent a lot of time. You know your way between. Oh, right, Knoxville yeah. And Nashville. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it was great to live with a couple of other women, and I shared a house with them. I'm still friends with both of those women. Melinda Brands, remarkable career that you have, Romel, <laughs> that, that you know to this very day. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So when you arrived in Nashville. What happened next? Well, we we had bought a house together in uh, Eaton's Creek Road in Joelton, out in Joelton. And so, and even on the weekends, when I was coming for the weekend, he would leave Saturday morning to go to the downtown Y. And we had always worked out together in Knoxville. We'd go to the Y. But here, it was a men-only Y. And uh, it was very frustrating to not to be left behind every Saturday morning when I would come or when I moved here even. So uh, one afternoon when I was actually sunbathing with Margaret Bem and Juliet Griffin. Oh, this is trouble already. <laughs> yeah, well, I was just venting to them about, uh, it's just not right, you know, that they don't let women into the downtown Y. And Margaret is a strategic thinker. Certainly. And she said, let's think what we can do about this. This isn't a, something we want to file a lawsuit. Let's because we didn't even know that we had a cause of action. We didn't know. We found out later. I need a Kleenex. I need a Kleenex. I don't see any. We run to the restaurant. Can I do that? Sure. Where is it? We're off the record. We're off the record. We're off the record. Go to the right and out the door. Sure. 
shower stuck on the eye. Oh, spring is coming. Okay, back, back on the, on the record. record. And it's about 11 25 back on the record. Okay. So for, for, for Cameron. Okay. okay, back on the record. Well, so I was, we found out later that the YMCA National had a, a rules, uh, their rules were their non discrimination. It was so the local YMCA was violating those rules, but nobody had challenged them because they thought no women would want to join the downtown Y. They thought they, the secretaries couldn't afford it. <laughs> they thought it was a men only thing. Anyway, so what year was this? This was about, um, Let's see, when did I, I finish, I entered, finished law school in December 78. So it was about 79 or 80, All right. maybe 1980, okay. 78, 79, 79. And so Margaret said, why don't we write to the board, the, the local board? So we wrote to the chairman of the board and said that we were interested and they just ignored our letter. So and I, because by then I was working in the courthouse with uh, the chancellors, and um, so I knew some reporters from the courthouse. And so we decided I should apply. I should go and ask for an application. And we should have a photographer there from the newspaper to record this. And so I did that. I went and asked for a membership application at the downtown Y. And the photographer took the picture. And of course, they told me we don't let in women. So that got publicized. And um, they still weren't doing, they still were ignoring us. So um, we decided to go to, uh, to show up from one of, for one of their board meetings. So we did, we showed up and they- This they, again is still you and Margaret- ben, Margaret and Juliet. And, Juliet. and there was another woman, Susan, who was uh, Judge Wiseman's um, assistant, administrative assistant, and uh, the four of us. And so we went to their board meeting, we went in and um, said we want to join, and they said, "Well, I can't." They they, they didn't. It felt hostile. It felt like they were hostile to us. They they were. Of course, it would have, from their point of view, they would have to create women's locker rooms. They didn't have any women's locker rooms, and they didn't know that it'd be worth the while. Their while to do that because they thought it was just four people. <laughs> <laughs> only four women would only four women would ever want to come to the line. So um, they said they would talk about it and they would get back with us. And so I can't remember how it all played out, but eventually they told us that um, we had to get uh, um, 150 women to sign agreements to join and to put down $150 or put down some amount of money that they committed them. And they gave us like a month to do it for some period of time. And so we broke up in teams and we had meetings, we went all over. And eventually we got about a hundred women. Um, and we thought, oh, it's not enough. It's not gonna be enough, but we submitted those. And apparently there was a, a contractor on the board who said, look, there's, I think it could help us because they were having problems with losing members. Mm -hmm. So here's a hundred people that want to join. And I bet if they can get a hundred to put down money, there's probably more. So they said, okay, even though we didn't meet their, um, their requirements. What a victory that uh, was. Yes, yes. So then they, they, we renovated the Y, put in women's locker rooms. And I remember the first time I went and went, ran on the upstairs track. Um, there were guys on the track. Apparently I was the first woman ever to run on that track. And before I ran, I did a stretch. I you know, put one leg on the wall and sort of spleen in. Well, I found out later, that John McLemore was on that track. And I, I didn't know him then, but later on I got to know him. And he said, when you came up to that track, you did this gymnastic thing against this stretch against the wall. <laughs> And then when you started, I wasn't running fast, you started jogging. All the men on that track sped up. <laughs> <laughs> it was like some sort of male peacock. We had to show them how to do this. Yes, we got them. <laughs> That's funny. But did you swim in the pool also? Um, I don't, I wasn't a swimmer back then. I am a swimmer, but um, no, because I had to, you know, my hair, I had to 
oh, didn't yeah. want to get my hair wet, to get uh -huh. back to work. But uh -huh. I ran on the track and they had classes. I went to the classes and worked out with the weight. So go yes. to the weight room, which was, that was kind of intimidating with all the guys in the weight sure. room. And then to celebrate our victory, we had a potluck and I got a, um, I don't know if you can see this. This is a piece of tile from the original Y. Oh my. Somebody salvaged it and we gave each other awards. Why <laughs> Buster? It was for the original four people. It says Chris Norris. Why Buster? Buster. <laughs> and I forgot to show this picture when I first came to the Nashville Bar. This was a oh, Nashville Bar are. picnic. Oh my. Um, um, yeah, we were, you know, young and just ready to just put me in, coach. Change the world. Change the just world. Put me in. Oh my just gosh. a woman who went for it. And you haven't <laughs> changed a bit, either you nor John. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so good memory. So tell me about 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 your law jobs. How do well, you I've, I've got a job with. The, I've been so fortunate. When I was at UT Law School, I didn't know what I what where I could work, and I saw a sign, and there were no internet job, you know, notices, but there was a paper taped to the window or the wall at the career center of a council to the chancellors, the Davidson County chancellors, of being a law clerk. And I thought that sounded interesting. So I applied to that. And then I got interviewed. And um, Bob, Bob Rand and Alan High and Ben Cantrell, three of my heroes to this day. Mine too. Yeah, fabulous people, fabulous judges. And eventually I got the job, <clears throat> although Bob Rant told me later that he had run into me at a Sierra Club meeting the night that I had interviewed. And we, I didn't know he was a member. He didn't know I was a member. But he said, you impressed me more at the Sierra Club meeting than you did in the interview. Anyway, so I got the job. And that was just a dream job. Oh, it's the best job in Nashville. Yeah, it is. And for people who are cynical about judges, you know, they think, People, when I read things on next door, you know, on the internet about, oh, that was fixed or this was fixed. I have to say, I have, these judges, there's no reason to be cynical, at least from what I observed about Nashville judges. They're just good people, honest people, smart people, trying to follow the law and do their best. And make very hard decisions. Make hard decisions, yeah. Yes. And I need to insert one thing. But before I got the chancellor's job, when I was waiting for my bar results, um, I... Uh, I was a clerk for Justice Brock on the Supreme Court. On the Tennessee Supreme, Tennessee Supreme, Court. Supreme Court. Just for like six months because my uh, a friend of mine from law school, Sylvia Brown, she had gotten hired by Justice Brock for, I think it was a, a year or two years. And she got a job and had to leave before her term ended. So she called me and asked if I would be interested. In, and I said, yes. So I interviewed with Justice Brock and he was wonderful. He was uh it was the other clerks in that building. We all uh, bonded and Justice Brock let me, um, he gave me a lot of substantive work. You know, that was here in Nashville. Yeah, here in Nashville mm -hmm. at, at the Supreme Court building. Mm -hmm. And Mary, uh, Martha Craig Doffrey was on the Court of Criminal Appeals. We all know her as Sissy Doffrey. Sissy Doffrey. Yes. Uh, other, otherwise known as the, uh, uh, for the woman for whom the Martha Craig Daughtry Award is named. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, so she would organize potlucks for the women clerks in the building. And we would go to her house. And then from the potlucks, um, a, a softball team started, the Shipley and Bem uh, softball team. All the women, the young women in Nashville, young women lawyers, and we played softball in this league in West Nashville. It was great. We know the them is Margaret Bem. Margaret Bem and, and Marietta Shipley. Marietta Shipley. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Harlan Dodson would like was helping to coach us, and that's where Margaret and Harlan met, I think. And they I did not know that. They've been married a long time. Yes, they have. Um, so that was a real rich time for, uh, even though we didn't have opportunities in law firms, there was a lot of support for, for each other Yes, uh, for women. And I remember I interviewed, before I got the chancellor clerk job, I interviewed with a law firm here in town and they couldn't figure out where to take me to lunch because they all ate at these men only lunch clubs. You know, there was the Cumberland Club, the City Club, and they were yes. all men only. And so finally they had to figure that out and that they could take me to a, like a restaurant somewhere, but they couldn't figure out where to, because there was, 
these men would all eat lunch together and do business at lunch with each other and women couldn't go. And so this was around the 1980s, early 1980s? Yeah, 79, uh -huh. 79, 80, yeah. Wow, and, and so uh, that, that eventually changed, but during, during those, those first years, that's the way it was. That's the way it was. It's the way it was. And I, uh, before I also before I um, started the job at the chancellor's, I think before I got the jo job with Justice Brock, I was a law clerk for the public defender's office. And Mike Engel really mentored me. And I, he's still one of my heroes. And that was a great opportunity to you know, go to the jail and interview people yes. and hear their stories. Yes. So that was a broadened by experience. Too. Now, now, isn't that interesting, Chris? That uh, you know, the, the the restaurants, of course, were for men men only. Well, the the eating clubs. The eating clubs were for, for men only. But think about the the men who were thinking outside of the box. Mm -hmm. The the three chancellors, and then of course Erwin uh, Kilcrease came along like later. Yeah. Uh, they were certainly they were certainly people who were willing to give women a chance. Yes, yeah. that was huge. Huge. And Justice Brock, the same thing. Right. Yeah. One time, I, I remember one case from when I, we, I don't know if we have time, but um, she, he, uh, there was a case where this 15-year-old uh, had committed, I think he was 15, had committed a crime on his 16th birthday. And I, th I think I'm, this, I may have the facts confused, but it's something like that. And so on the, on, when someone was 16, they could be tried as an adult. And so that was the issue. Um, his lawyers had kept appealing that he was a minor, and I found I found some authority the lawyers hadn't found that said that you actually turn a year older the day after your birthday, and so I showed that to Justice Brock, and he went with it, and so <laughs> that changed the, the it changed case. the outcome. Yeah. Yes, that is. Isn't that remarkable? Yes. Uh, I, I bet he was so thankful at that point that he had hired you on. I don't know, but uh, he was a, he was always open to new new angles on things. Although I'm sure the lawyers in the case thought, well, why are the why are this is the judge coming up with authorities that they hadn't even yes. raised? But isn't that interesting? Uh -huh. Because the judge had somebody who did some good research <laughs> and discovered that. Right. It's, and so it was a, it was fun. I remember I'd come home to my husband and he was practicing criminal law and we would, we'd wake up in the night, and tell each other legal law stories. <laughs> and, you know, this is what happened to me. This is today. And he can tell this is what happened. <laughs> Did you get any sleep? I sometimes, yeah, especially, but when we had a baby, then we, we all oh, anyway, up for sure. Yeah, and then we tell each other stories before we, so we could get back to sleep. Get back to sleep. <laughs> oh my gosh. Going back to your time as counsel to the chancellors, mm -hmm. what, what types of cases did, 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 were, you, were you seeing? Well, um, it was a, such an uh, interesting time to be here because the, the courthouse had its own reporters from the Tennessean and the Nashville Bar. There was a lot more local coverage in the news of what was happening in the courthouse. So Kirk Loggins, and I, he worked with the Tennessean, and he had his own office down in the basement. And he developed friendships with all the, the, the clerk's offices to know what cases were, any interesting cases. And Chancellor Hyde had a case about abortion that was going through the courthouse then. And, uh, and I was pregnant then. And so I, and I was showing him pictures of you know, the book about the size of the fetus and all this stuff, but he, um, he ruled that women should have the, their choice. And that made all the national, or not national, local news and Tennessee, Tennessee news. Of course, then it went up to the Supreme Court. Martha, uh, Sissy Daughtry, I think was on the Supreme Court then. I can't remember what happened, but. Um, That's I, right. for, yeah. for several years, she was, uh -huh. she was a, a state Supreme Court justice. Right. And I think that they ended up finding that based upon the Tennessee Constitution, that there was a, a right of privacy. Of course, that the, the, constant, the makeup of our state courts has changed since then. And, and so I think the legislature later on passed that there's no right in the law saying there's nothing in the state constitution that creates a right of privacy that gives women the right to abortions if the federal laws ever changed. So, um, but that was interesting to be part of that. And then just at Chancellor High also had a small schools case where the schools sued uh, to challenge the uh, apportionment of funding 
because they felt like they weren't getting enough support from their schools and that the, the city, the metropolitan schools were able to raise so much more money with their local retail sales taxes. So he decided the small schools place that at small schools case and out of that came what, what is now referred to as the outmoded BEP, better education plan, but, um, but it was uh, new at that time. So it was to create more, a more fair funding system. There was a lot of history being created yes. during those years. In the chance record, in, chance in record the Davidson Davis. County chance yes. record. Yeah. 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 And uh, Ben Cantrell had a search and seizure case about an employee at the Tennessee State Museum who had her purse searched. And that didn't make as much news, but it was still very interesting about were, whether employees have a, meaningful, cases. meaningful cases. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, 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 Ultimately, if, even if they were not ones that, that are that the people remember today, nevertheless, changed mm -hmm. changed the law. Changed the law, isn't the, across the state? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And and the, the chancellors were such wise people. Yeah, and they they were so admirable. Yes, uh, you know, I just still have so much respect for for um, Ben Cantrell, who then got who was elect, appointed to the Court of Appeals. Um, and and reelected on the Court of Appeals, yes. and, and then uh, Bob Brand and Alan High, and then went after Ben Cantrell was promoted, then Irvin Kilcrease yes. came in. He was fabulous. Yes. He used to say before he'd go into court, "Let's strike another blow for justice." That's wonderful. <laughs> that's wonderful. Yes. <laughs> that that's wonderful. Uh, At some point, you became clerk and master. How did that happen? Well, that's another just serendipity. Um, I was the clerk for them and I re-upped for another year, I think. So I was going to be two years there. And then my, that term was about to end. And the, the guy who was the clerk and master, and there'd only been guys in that job, he got indicted for uh, having the staff do personal work for him. And um, so the chancellors decided to replace him. And so uh, Alan Hyde, I had no thought about, you know, I, was, I had just had a baby. I was not thinking about trying to get some big job. So uh, he called me into his office and said, have you thought about applying for this? And I said, well, no, I was thinking about taking some time off to spend time with my baby and he, my daughter. And he said, well, this job, you, you, it closes the job off office closes at 415, you know, you can do both, you can do both of these things. So I applied and Bob Brandt told me later um, that it was uh, Alan High who was really my, um, who was pushing for me to get the job. So I'm very grateful to him today. And so I became the only, it was a headline in the Nashville banner and Brandt always wanted to be supportive he said it must have been a slow news day because <laughs> i was the first woman ever to uh, be named clerk and master in in nashville and the first in history first in history yes oh my <laughs> so but, but then when i got pregnant again shortly after being appointed which wasn't planned but um i felt like i couldn't i had to stay i couldn't just leave so you know i did the best i could to get good childcare at home um, and took, I took like three weeks off for my second daughter and um, brought her into work in a baby holder for some days. But, um, and they've turned out to be wonderful people, yes. my two daughters, so <laughs> they survived. They survived. <laughs> But I did that, and uh, did they become lawyers? No, because <laughs> they, as they say, they got tired of hearing John and I talk about law. He said, "You talked about law all the time." <laughs> so uh, one is a LCSW uh, therapist, social oh. worker, and with kids, and she lives in St. Louis. And the other one is a a, a writer. She's a um, freelance writer, and she teaches yoga. She's got a private yoga clientele a big clientele they're both following their their mom's way of of thinking outside the box yeah, yes taking the road not taken they're taking their own roads <laughs> <laughs> they paddle <they're> their own canoes <laughs> what other kinds of cases when you were clerk and master what, what kinds well let, let me ask you this as clerk and master mm -hmm. in, in addition to all of your administrative jobs tasks what 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 else did you do well the administrative it was two two real different jobs. Yes. One was running the clerk's office, yes. and I have to give uh, 
many kudos to the uh, women that worked in that office. Wonderful they had wonderful people, Doris Willis and uh, Joetta Kemp. They were the two real leaders of that office and they trained me, they educated me in how things worked. Um, and I instituted um, teams and put people under them and then we'd have team leader meetings and we'd, they would also interview people when, when we had to hire somebody. And then, but apart from all that and trying to come up with uh, forms, the outdated forms in that office and one of the people on the staff there, um, she had gone to a class on forms creation Jenna Varum. So she came up with this blocks, this form that had blocks, open block, fill in the blank forms that was so much easier for people to use. And so we started, we created those forms and they have gone all around the state. I think lots, most of the clerk's offices use those forms now. But in addition to that kind of uh, issues, um, I had to hear cases that the chan chancellors would refer factual disputes to me, like if, for instance, um, boundary line disputes, I'd hear surveyors, I'd have in a conference room, I would hold hearings in a conference room and hear from the side. And um, if there was a dispute about assets in an estate, I would uh, hear evidence about who owned a house. I would hear evidence or uh, damages, what if the, once the judge found liability, he could refer it to me to determine the damages. So yeah, that was real interesting. So I had to write a lot of uh, my opinions and then they, they could appeal them to the chancellor, but it took some work off the chancellor's list. So that's what I did. So you did some judicial types right. of, of mm -hmm. tasks or jobs as, as, as well. Mm -hmm. What an interesting job that was. It was. Yeah. How long were you clerking that? Eight years. I did that for eight years. And, um, then I decided, and it was, and I'm so grateful for those eight years. And it, the job, the, the administrative part of the job was like working in an emergency room because you never knew what was going to come in that day. Yeah. You know, what crisis would occur right. that day. Right. What case was going to be filed. Yeah. Or like be... if there was a procedural dispute in, in terms of like the office staff coming to me and saying, asking questions about what procedure applied or this. And we didn't have any fax filing. Like people had to come in. And there's a lot of funny stories about, uh, one young lawyer came in and Jana Herrera was at the new complaints desk. So he was looking around kind of lost with the paper. And she said, is that a new suit? And he said, yeah, my wife bought it for me. He <laughs> was new. He was very new. <laughs> a lot of funny things like that. Must have been so embarrassed. <laughs> I don't think she told it. She said, oh, I mean, is that a complaint? You have a complaint. Yeah, no. <laughs> but there were a lot of fun. Or like the new moon, there'd always be like the lost princess the, from, the, the, from Russia. You know, one of the czar royalty would show up whenever there was a new moon in the clerk's office. So there was a lot of fun things that happened. Right? Oh, that's, that's remarkable. Yeah. That's remarkable. <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 what was like? like for you after after you left the clerk and master well i decided to leave because i'd had two children and i um and i wanted to be able to and i had an, actually i turned 40 and i had this fear that all I was, this was before you turned 40 no, i was about to turn 40 and i had a, a fear that i was going to just die at my desk and never get to spend time with my children <laughs> so i decided to take a year off so give myself a sabbatical year yes. Um, and the other thing was that my husband was a trial lawyer. And so, and he got real involved. He started defending, a, doing a lot of work for insurance companies. So he uh, had jury trials like once a month. So if, if a child got sick, I mean, there was no question he was not available. So it was me. I was having to, you know, be the default at home as well as um, keep up with what everything was happening at work. So I just needed a, a change, a break. You were juggling a lot of balls. I was juggling a lot of balls. So, yeah. um, but I was, a, I'm glad for that opportunity. So I took a year off and then uh, Claudia Bonneman got appointed. So another woman, I didn't just end it. Um, you started a tradition. I started a trend, right? <laughs> because I remember Betty Nixon came up to me one time and she said, you know, we work so hard and then you quit that job. And I said, well, Claudia is doing a wonderful yes. job. So, anyway, 
but no, you were the you were the you were the first. Yes, but um, but it's important for people to make their own choices. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. So what's best for you at that time in your right, life? Right, right, and and. And again, you were thinking outside the box. I guess, I don't know, but I did. Um, what was necessary to do. Yeah, but that was a big news story too at the time about that I was quitting and that um, they interviewed my husband, they interviewed people about, and but anyway, that's probably, that's why Betty Nixon knew about it. Ah, uh, <laughs> and, and so you, you spent some time at home. I spent a year at home. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, my kids were, you know, already in elementary school, mm -hmm. but I, I was, I learned it was important to, to be there when I loved being there when they got home mm -hmm. and um, having the radio on, it felt more homey, I think, to them. <laughs> and not that I would immediately be with them, mm -hmm. but I'd be available. Sure. Uh -huh. sure. And so that was rich. And so I did that for a year. And then I got a part-time job working on contract for the AG's office. And there's so many more part-time or less That's attorney general. Yeah, the attorney general's criminal division yeah. where I could get the trial transcript. I remember Jerry Smith interviewed me and I knew him from UT. So he was a good guy. He later on became a criminal. He did. Court, court of criminal he appeals. Did. He was a deputy at yeah. the attorney general. Mm -hmm. But he hired me. Ah. Uh-huh. So um, it was an interesting setup. They didn't, they wouldn't, didn't want employees because they didn't want to pay the uh, FICA taxes. So, and they didn't have room for more people. So they would, you go by, it was on contract. You pick up the trial transcript, read the uh, defendant's, convicted defendant's uh, brief on appeal, and then write a response. Um, so I could take it, I could take the transcripts to the orthodontist office <laughs> and live, be, be able to but you do it at home yes. most of the time. But yes. I'd have to show up and argue the case in the court of appeal, court of criminal appeals. But but you would not have to. I did argue. Oh, you did. Yeah, you they did wanted argue. to. You would, you would do the arguments. Would that take you to all the different? No, cases? we only did. They only gave us cases that were set in Nashville, mm -hmm. so they didn't have to pay sure. for travel. Time. Sure, sure. Any other kinds of law jobs that you that you did? Well, I got a job um, eventually with a. Um, uh, it was an insurance defense firm, mm -hmm. Parker, uh, Cantrell, and Dean, oh, and sure. for a couple of years. Okay. Um, but it just wasn't a good fit for me. They were they were great people, mm -hmm. and they trained me and how to. I didn't know how to write an answer. I mean, I had the general idea. I just had never done it. Sure. So they would go over it with me. I remember Bob Parker. He would go over it with me. But um, it just wasn't. I didn't like the work much. Mm -hmm. And I remember leaving for lunch one day and thinking, but I don't want to go back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Because I was fighting with people over things like they, if they had put things in a U-Haul uh, storage unit and it had been stolen, and then they filed an insurance claim and we were trying to avoid paying it, that kind of thing. It wasn't a good fit. For it you. wasn't a good fit. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so eventually I left, and it was a good thing I left then because my mother got terminally ill, and so I got to spend a lot of time with her that before was she died. That that was was, this it was in 1998. Yes. Yes. Uh, around that time frame, also, I think Chancellor Hyde was considering retiring. No, he had had a stroke, sadly. Okay. He had a stroke, and he wasn't thinking about leaving, but he was still kind of impaired. Yes. Um, but he could still function, you yes. know, but um, he was a little impaired. So his clerk uh, was, his law clerk was leaving, and so I forget if, who, if I called them or they called me or what, but I went and worked as his law clerk for like a year and um, tried to uh, support him. That so, was a good thing. Yeah, it was, I was enjoying. I know, I appreciated that. Well, and I liked being helpful to him. And then, um, and eventually it, it became apparent that he really needed to leave. So he, it, his term ended and he didn't run again. Yes. But that was, I valued that. Yes. There was a time when you served as a um, as a chancellor, right? And when Chancellor High left, um, then the governor hadn't appointed anybody. So there was like a month or two when I think uh, Judge, uh, not Judge, but maybe it was Judge Shriver who had uh, was a criminal court judge who had been the local DA. He appointed me because he was the trial head trial sure. judge to sit there. That was the, well, they let they could appoint someone as an interim 
So I, I was the special chancellor for a couple months. And that was interesting until Ellen Lyle got it. Yes. She, and that was, and she was, I think, appointed to part two. Is part two. And I was a special chancellor in part two. That's where Ellen High was. Ellen High had been mm -hmm. online. And so, so you, you, you served in a lot of different roles right. uh -huh. in Chancery Court, didn't you? Right. And back then, too, before that happened, um, when the judges couldn't be there for a trial, they would appoint me and I would be a special chancellor um, just for the day. They'd have to get, I'd have sure. to get sworn. There was a rule that you could get a gathering of people and conduct an election. <laughs> and it was, but it was a, fixed election and I would get elected and we'd fill out the form and sign it and um, then I would hear cases and one of those cases was uh, uh, whether insurance companies could be charged with violating the Consumer Protection Act. It was a win mint was one of the uh, plaintiffs. It was a uh, bad faith um, that they wouldn't pay his insurance claim and it, the judge decided that they had the insurance company had committed bad faith so it, the judge eventually found that yes they were liable for treble damages, but I heard a little bit of it on one day. When well, that's that's a complex kind of Yeah, case. it was a complex wow. case. It was very interesting. And it, I don't know if it's still law, but it was law for a long time. It's, wow, that's that's a feeling of some satisfaction. Right, to you contributed to that. Yeah, mm -hmm. before I wanted, I want to talk to you about Norris and Norris, but right. before I do, uh -huh. I want that you were also very active in the community and also very active in the bar. Right. Well, the bar, the women's bar. Well, I was on the bar NBA board and first NBA, vice, the yeah, National, bar, National Association. bar Association board, and I was first vice president of it, and that was interesting. But it was back then people smoked during in conference rooms, and one of the board members, it was a woman, she would light up during the board oh. meeting, and I had to be the bad guy and say, "Look, I, I'm allergic to this," right. but it was like a it was awkward. Yeah, it can be stifling to be in a room with, with smoke. Oh, yeah. Right. Uh -huh. But um, but then the, I, I was one of the founder, founding members of LAW, the Women well, Lawyers, Lawyers Association. Association for Women. Right. And that was very uh, satisfying, too. There was a lot of pushback from that. Even good people like Bob Brandt would say, I don't understand why you want to create a separatist organization when you're, you're pushing for inclusion. And people don't, didn't understand. And so um, we had to say, look, it's to give us leadership opportunities and for us to advocate for more women on the bench. Back then there were Martha, uh, Sissy Daughtry was like the only one on the bench. And so, uh, and there were no women judges, trial judges in Nashville and very few anywhere else. So, uh, and it accomplished its goals. Right. There's Barbara Haynes, who was um, General Sessions Court. Uh, I can't remember, maybe, Maybe then I don't yes. know what what you, LIW was founded in like eighty one or eighty two. Oh, I, I think she was elected. Yeah, I think it was later. Later, okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, but was Chancellor Brandt right? Was this no, a no, no, he was, organization? No, because <laughs> we where men could join. That's why it was a lawyers association um, for women, not of women. Mm -hmm. And a lot of men, several men joined who are uh, supportive of women. And so it was to advocate for our specific mission, which is more women on the bench, more women partners in law firms, uh, better uh, family-friendly policies. Um, Those are good for everybody. Good for everybody. everybody. And LAW is not only still existing today, but thriving. Thriving. Thriving today. Mm -hmm. It's good. And it's accomplished a lot of its goals. We just had another woman uh, appointed to the state Supreme Court. Um, and we've had many, but how many, like, Five women have served, I think, at different times. There was a time when the majority of, of justices on the state Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals were all well, oh, right. At one point, there were three out of five mm -hmm. on the state Supreme that's Court. Right. And that's because of LAW, I'm convinced. Well, LAW and, and the amazing people, the amazing members of mm -hmm. LAW, yes. who, who, uh, who made such a difference for right. so many other Alayda people. Alayda Trauger and Margaret Bem and uh, and don't forget Chris Norris. And for me, <laughs> all the founders have, um, I think, made a difference. And so many of us benefited from that. Yes. Here's a big thank you. Oh, well, thank you, Mary. And you were one of the ones. But when you got here, you went to work. Well, <laughs> it, it certainly was such a, a, a welcome, welcome way to start the practice of, uh, of, of, of being a lawyer uh -huh. in, in Nashville. And I'm, I will always be grateful for, for that. 
Uh, let's talk about Norris and Norris. What is Norris and Norris? Tell me about this. Well, um, I think I know who the two Norris yeah, are. Yeah, my husband and I. Yeah, he um, he had worked for like 20, 70, 30 years at another a law firm, Hollins, Wexter, and Yarbrough, and it was a real good experience for him. But um, he had stopped doing insurance work and had started doing plaintiff's work. So it became, um, he just felt like he needed to get up to leave and go on his own. And so, because it was a different, he could, wasn't bringing in money steadily. And there's all these issues in law firms about, you know, bringing who's brought money in this month. Anyway, so, uh, and at that point, I, I got elected to the school board. I was serving as an elected member, member of the Metro School Board, and um, which I did um, starting in 2000, and that from 2000 to 2004. And uh, so it was toward my, the end of that, about 2004. And he said, we need to start our own law firm. And he found a, uh, an office, an empty office in the same building where he, we had, he had worked. It was the Third National Financial Center. I don't know what it's called now, but um, uh, it's next to the old Third National Bank building on the 13th floor. <laughs> I mean, that's why <laughs> nobody wanted it. But so um, we, I just had to go out I said, I didn't have any clients. I said, can't you find somebody else? And he said, no, should be us. So he made a good choice. Yeah, so I had to figure out how to buy a fax machine and how to or how to set up network computers. And I, it was uh, education about that too, how to hire people. And, and so we did it, how to set up QuickBooks on the computers. He came in one day and he had, he had, had settled a case or resolved the case and I needed expense. I need an expense sheet. And I said, what's an expense sheet? <laughs> But I, there was a woman in an accountant's office who was helping me. So she showed me how to produce a, an expense sheet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. another <laughs> aspect of her life that you didn't know was going to happen. I didn't happen. know it was going to happen. I was thrust into it. <laughs> and, 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 but I felt I eventually built my own practice. So I wasn't just running the office. I was sort of a remain sort of a managing partner of running the administrative side, but I built my own practice. What was your practice? Well, I, I, as I said, I didn't have a single client. So yeah. I got on lists where I could for appointment lists at the probate court for guardian ad litem and legal aid for um, social security disability. And they would, I would get appointments. And um, so then I did the work and they started sending me more and more and my name went, got out and I started building a practice, both in probate and in uh, mainly estate administration, but also some uh, simple wills. Sure. I mean, I wasn't an, I didn't claim to be an expert mm -hmm. in estate tax, but I knew about how to administer an estate and how to write a, a simple will. Mm -hmm. So, and I would take more courses and, and the best way I learned, best way I learned though, was to teach a course. I would sign up to teach a course in pro basic probate law. So after I'd learned enough to teach the course, then I would, it would be more reinforced in me when you have to, if there are all right. these private businesses that right. market one day courses in these yeah. subjects. So I, ta I taught those courses and then I would really learn it. And then I had to draft right materials for the course. So I reinforced my knowledge all in those ways. Uh, and then, um, and social security disability was satisfying because both those came, both, what I loved about both those areas of the law was that, you didn't have to force people to pay you up front because if someone had an estate that actually there was assets in, the court would set your fee at the end and you'd be paid out of the estate. So then if people, they're all getting money. Everyone, all the beneficiaries are getting sure. money. So they don't really mind paying the lawyer, sure. you know, and then in social security disability, you get paid a percentage of someone's back pay. Right. And so the government would send me the check and the, the poor impaired dis disabled person didn't have to scrape right. up the funds. Right, right. And, 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 uh, and, and so you, you really taught yourself a new area. Yeah, I, two areas of law. And I would go to national conferences uh, with the uh, disability yes. uh, practice group and uh, the probate bar was, had a lot of educational courses. And I eventually developed, in, even after we finally closed the office after about 14 or 15 years in 2015, I'd still be getting a lot of calls for uh, people wanting to hire both your, uh, either probate lawyer or a You just disability. never know. You just you never know. know. It, it's a, it, back then the internet helped because we, um, you know, there's, I would 
we had a web website and it was, could be found by search engines. And I had testimonials. You learned how to market yourself on yes. the internet. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. You, you, you not only learned a new, uh, two new areas of law, but at the same time, you were learning how to keep a law office running. How to keep a law office running, how to deal with personnel, you know, personnel issues, sure. how to new developments in, um, in the internet. <laughs> and, right, it's exactly, mm -hmm. all of that. Right. All, all of that. Yeah, just, uh -huh. it was good. But what, what a fascinating, what a fascinating thing that is. And I also, I met Katie to back up. It's, I also really enjoyed being on the school board. I met people from all over the county. I still have relationship, acquaintance relationships yes. with people from all parts of the county, North Nashville, um, you know, uh, Southeast Nashville. So that was a good experience too. When I got on the school board, I thought, oh, they settled the desegregation lawsuit. How wonderful, I don't have to deal with that. Well, that was wrong because even though they'd settled it in principle, it hadn't been implemented mm -hmm. yet in the area in District 9, in like Bellevue, where yes. I was, was my district. And so there were a lot of bumps in the road to try to get that. Um, and <sighs> sleepless <Yeah>. nights. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. To try to not drive all middle class people out of the school system, but still create a diverse school. Right, <laughs> right. That was a that was a huge a huge development mm -hmm. for for the school. Right, system. it was. It was a tremendous. Yes. Uh, it was stressful time. It was. It was. There are stressors still, mm -hmm. but that was that it's was more settled now than it used to be. Yes. Thank God they finally settled boundary. They not we're not changing school boundaries like well, we were. Well, th th that brings us up to about I guess 2017, 2018. Well, we I, we closed our law office in 2015. In 2015. Yeah. Okay. But was that for the purpose of retiring? Retiring. Both you and and, and, John. and John. We left. We closed that office on the same day. Yeah. But well, after history. all of this. How's retirement? Oh, I highly recommend retirement. Although I, it's hard to retire because as you stop, the hard thing that what you have to do is stop taking cases. And that's hard to do. If you get a good call about a good case, you have to just have a referral list, refer it out. But then as you have fewer and fewer cases, then you have less money coming in, but the expenses all stay the same. The rent, if you have, let, you know, you're trying to winnow employees. But so we finally, we still had active cases when we closed the office. So we finished them up at home. We took the files home yes. and just in our home office, finished yes. those cases. Yes, and finished and finish uh -huh. them up. Right. Wow, how satisfying that had to have yeah, been. Yeah, it though. was, it, it was. And it, take, it was a, there, it takes a couple of years to get your retirement sea legs. Um, and I loved it because all my life I've loved to read. So I spent about the first year on my on a sofa reading. <laughs> That's what I'd always wanted to do with rather when I was had a bad day at work. I could just go home and read. Home and, read. <laughs> <laughs> and then eventually I get involved in I have an active walking group that I have opportunities to walk different places every day. I suspect day. Chris Norris. That you are not one just to sit. Uh, <laughs> no, and I tutor. I'm now still tutoring a volunteer. I'm a volunteer tutor with the, um, the school system on the internet. During COVID, they set up a internet tutoring with a second grader at Inglewood Elementary. I, did, I used last year, it was at Carter Lawrence Elementary. So you're back to being a teacher. Back as to well. being a teacher, but it's just an hour for like, sure. or half an hour for three days a week. And then I'm a volunteer. Both John and I are volunteers for Bookham, where we go to uh, Cockrell Elementary and read to the kids and give out books, distribute books. Oh, that's wonderful. It's very satisfying. Oh, that's fun. Mm -hmm. That's fun. Chris, in this whole time that we have been together, amazing time you have described all the things that you have done uh, in, in just in the area of law you've been a clerk for the supreme court right. clerk for the davidson county chancery court of course clerk and master you've been in court administration <laughs> you yourself have been a judge when you served as chancellor as when you were both clerk and master and and then as specially appointed Chancellor, you did all of that. You started a law firm mm -hmm. and 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 practiced in two new, well, several areas of law, including two totally new ones right. for two years. I can go on and on. 
You, yeah, well, and there's so many more opportunities for women now. Well, I, I was I was going to ask you, and mm -hmm. I haven't even described all <laughs> the things for for someone who was. Who, I, I think the word to describe this is independence, independence <laughs> of mind. Well, I think uh, just when you realize, I, I, I any any area where you feel like you're not respected or you're not you're not happy in what you're doing, yeah. I would advise women to. Uh, use, use, use your own initiative. And women are doing that more and more to how to make it better for you and yet be, be, sat at, be performing uh, whatever function it is that you feel called to perform. You know, in my case, it was um, representing people in cases that I uh, felt satisfying. I used to tell people I was in the, the nurturing branch of the legal profession yes. because both probate administration and state administration and Social Security disability. That's just the area that I felt sat, brought but, satisfaction to me. But, but when you came into the, 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 the practice of law um, early, early on in the late 1970s, early 80s, that was a time when a, a woman couldn't even go into one of the eating clubs. No, and, and, you, and you had to wear a skirt and stop, right? And stop high, you know, and heels. Right. And yet, and yet, even at that time, you kept that independence in mind. <laughs> well, thank you, Mary. And all the things that you have, the advice that you are giving today for both women and men. Well, paddle your own canoe, as my father said. Yeah, you, certainly <laughs> did. You, you certainly did. Um, do you think that there are more opportunities now? For I do. Women? I do. Like when I see so many women starting their own law firms and um, finding, making their way, like when Barbara Moss was at, I think she was at Gullet Sanford. And so she would, uh, she created a, a, a family policy about for maternity leave. There were no maternity leave policies then. So they're creating it. And they've got some, many of the law firms in Nashville have, um, it's like there's tracks where you don't have to be on a partnership track, but you can be as a counsel or something of counsel to the firm where you don't but you can create your own hours yes. but yet make make enough money make it enough money to be satisfied but yet have a home life or become a, a, a in-house counsel to a, a general counsel to a business and there's so many healthcare businesses that now have women in their um, general counsel's office and not just law the healthcare companies but they're so HCA has a, a lot and I I think I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I'm right, but there may be, they may be more family friendly than the law firms were because back then they, they considered it um, required that you work on Saturday, the law firms, that you work six women. days a week and you were supposed to like bill. It was all about how many hours you were billing. It was a competitive billing race. And I think that it's gotten different from, for women have made all the paths for themselves and there's more to be made. So, but right. I remember when Shipley Bem started, it was the first women's law firm. Yes, that's right. The, 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 the different, well, there are still, as you say, there are still paths that <laughs> still have to be trod or for the first time. <laughs> um, but I, I, for the purpose of this legal history project, <laughs> it is so important to preserve the fact that people like you, <laughs> Like Barbara Moss, but so many. Margaret Bam. Mar oh, my gracious. Oh, gracious. <laughs> we could go on. I don't know. Uh, but that women like. We were you, in the forefront. You were, we were confronted front. with a lot of closed doors. You were. Quite, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And you opened so many or doors. Or pushed them open. <laughs> pushed them open. That's right. Or knocked them down. Yeah. And there's yeah, the yeah. Let me get this back on the <laughs> Y Buster. Right, exactly. He's a child. Not that we just knocked out. Right. <laughs> but in physical <laughs> make life more uh, exactly suitable for our needs. That took a lot of guts. <laughs> a lot of guts. Well, Margaret Bam, she was strategic. I was the one who was like had the the sense that this ain't right, and she went. She found. She said, "This is what we need to do." Well, <laughs> you know. I, we are so thankful. Well, to you. thank you, so Mary. Thank you. You have not only changed the practice of law mm -hmm. and opened up doors. You've also made legal history, <laughs> and it's so important for this to be, be preserved. Well, thank you, and I'm so grateful for the women who came before me. And I yes. am too. Mm -hmm. Chris Norris, 
Thank you so much Thanks, Mary. for all the amazing things that you've done. <laughs> Thank you.